Hi everyone. A new release of Dask just came out with some big improvements around how we do a bit more smarter scheduling uh, to handle memory issues. And we're starting to see some of the evidence of that uh, hit the world. So I want to talk about a little bit about how that problem came about. Then we'll sort of dive into to seeing what actually happened and the benefits that we see. Uh, and then we'll, th then we'll sort of talk about some slides about what actually what happened and how we fixed it. So uh, this is a tweet from uh, Julius who's running some of his old Pangeo workloads uh, with Dask. And now suddenly, he says, suddenly uh, the stars are aligned and everything is just working. And we're starting to see this more and more. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, this issue that he's running into was really common. Uh, people call it, call it commonly, commonly called this uh, memory back pressure. Generally speaking, people saw that they would run workloads that should be able to run in a small amount of space, but for some reason they weren't. So it's very common in the geoscience community, but we've seen benefits of this all over the, all over the world. Uh, more recently, uh, JS Kenyon provided a really nice reproducer and some really some really evocative images about how this was was failing for him. Dask was doing too much communication beyond what it should have been doing. Uh, then uh, over the last few weeks, uh, Gabe Joseph uh, has written a lot of work to solve this problem in a really elegant way. And we're going to see the benefits of that solution right now. So I have made two different DAS clusters. Uh, I made one with the version of DAS that was released a month ago, and the version of the DAS that was released this month. It's actually not yet up on the Conda defaults channel yet, which is why I'm, I'm using pip here. And I've got two clusters, an old cluster for the release from June, and the new cluster, the release from July of this year, just a few days ago. I'm going to connect up to the old cluster, and we're going to see the bad behavior first. So let's connect up my JupyterLab session to that new Dask session. Let's get a number of bytes also in this so we can see memory use. And let's run a fairly simple computation. This is take, making an array of random data, then it's uh, computing the mean across some axis. So we see that it first starts off as being pretty embarrassingly parallel, all these blue blocks. Then we're starting to see a lot of red, a lot of this communication. You also know we're running out of memory, right? So we started with a very little memory used per worker. Now we're all the way up almost, almost to the point where it's fully saturated. We're seeing that also here in these orange blocks, Dask has noticed that it's running out of memory. So it's starting to write data to disk and that just slows everything down. This will eventually finish, but you'll notice at the beginning, we were really, really productive. There's a lot of really dense color over here. And now we're just not that productive. It's going to take a really long time for this to finish. We could solve this by adding a lot more memory to our cluster and increasing our costs, but we don't really want to do that. Now let's switch to our new cluster, the cluster running the new version of Dask. I'm going to switch my JupyterLab session over to look at that. Let's get that memory plot up again. And now we're going to run that same computation, but with the new version of Dask and see how it looks. So we see again that, that really strong start. Everything's really dense. We're using all of our cluster. Uh, we'll also see the number of amount of memory we're using is not climbing. It's moderate, but it's not huge. We're actually able to solve this problem in a, a small amount of space. And we're continuing to solve this entire problem without communication. And that stops that buildup of memory and it stops writing to disk. A lot of things are resolved because we were able to, to schedule our tasks uh, better and avoid that communication until the very end, we're moving around a few little things that need to be moved around. But we've avoided a lot of communication work and that has just helped our cluster to remain very healthy and very performant. So what happened between June and July of this year? Oh, what was the change? I'll do a, a quick slide presentation here. So imagine you've got three tasks, we do like some very basic task scheduling to build some intuition, then we'll talk about the change. If you've got three tasks you have to run, X and Y, which are sort of maybe data creation tasks, maybe reading, reading from some data source, and then Z, which requires both of those tasks. Now, a big part of what Dask does is it schedules these tasks. It decides which tasks run on which worker. So imagine that X ran on worker A and Y ran on worker B. Where should Z run? Well, Dask has to do a lot of thinking. It looks at the size of X, the size of Y, how busy is A, how busy is B, and it makes some determination maybe decides it should run task Z on worker B. 
And that means, of course, that it's got to communicate all the data that was on any worker that wasn't B over to B. So we see this sort of red arrow here. We had to move X around. And it's that communication which starts to slow things down. In the cases that we were seeing, that was especially bad because a lot of other work was going on at the same time. And DAS would just keep loading in more and more data, not really waiting for that communication to finish. When all this data showed up, the cluster would kind of start to slow down, and that was bad. So the new behavior, what we're doing now, we've still got that same situation X and Y and Z, but now before deciding where X and Y go, we're gonna look a little bit ahead in the future and say, oh, Z requires both X and Y, maybe they should be placed on the same worker. So now Dask, rather than being purely reactive, is looking ahead a little bit and trying to figure out what it should do based on future tasks it will have to run. Now, because X and Y are both on A, we know that we can run Z on worker A as well. That's the right choice. There's no communication necessary. We're not gonna slow down. But there are some challenges here. Note that we've, we've reduced parallelism, right? Of course, there's not gonna be any communication if you run all of your computations on the same machine, but then why are you running a parallel framework in the first place? Well, it turns out that often the kind of situations where Dask is run, parallelism is abundant, right? There's actually many, many tasks or many, many little graph motifs like this that we can run in parallel. The trick is realizing that this X, Y, Z thing shall be run together. So half of these will run on A and half of them run on, Z, on B, but we'll run them uh, consistently. And that small rotation, that small decision to look just a little bit ahead in the future, that results in much less memory use and results in people like Julius here being very happy that his DAS workloads are now running much, much more smoothly. So again, thanks to everyone who raised issues on this topic and thanks so much to Gabe Joseph for actually fixing the problem. Uh, and if you have run into uh, workloads that look, you know, kind of like it's it's slowing down. Let's actually go see if we can just look at our old cluster again. If you've run Dask workloads that look kind of like this, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of orange boxes because you're reading and writing from disk, there's a lot of big white space, you might want to update. So the release in 2021 of July, 07, that's got this new fix in it. It's, it's worth checking out. It actually makes a lot of things a lot smoother and allows you to run on much larger data sets than you have hardware. So it makes for a much smoother experience and a much more cost-efficient experience. So that's it. Thank you all for your attention.